Hello, everyone. Hey, guys. Uh, this is Jake Spazzaro here with Evolve Lab and my coworker, Daniel Cortez. And we're going to be talking about BIM coordination today. Uh, Daniel, you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah. So um, my background is in electrical and lighting design. And also, I did some, uh, I've been doing some coordination projects as well as like Dynamo work and automating a lot of uh, tasks in, within Dynamo or within Revit. Uh, so, we've been working on mostly MEP, but we're also doing architecture. Yeah. And then um, I'm a graduate from Texas AM University with a degree in construction science, and my background is mostly in a general contracting and also some prefabrication. Uh, so BIM coordination has been incredibly helpful for me from being out in the field to just making sure everything's constructible, constructible to being more like the MVP side and the coordination process, but then taking it a step further and taking it to fabrication in a shop. So uh, yeah, we're excited that you guys are here with us today and to talk about this. Cool. So let's check. All right, so let's get started. All right, so we're gonna talk about first, what is BIM coordination? So let's see. So I, uh, I made up a definition for BIM coordination and I know everyone has a little bit different of a definition, so. What I came up with is that BIM coordination is the process of constructing a building virtually before it's actually built and therefore allowing a team, the build team to identify schedule, cost, design, and constructability issues before they become an issue in the field and ahead of time so that you're not out there tearing things down and whatnot. You're just, you're ready to go once you get out in the field and it, it not eliminates, but limits the surprises that you're gonna run into. Cool. All right, guys, so do we have any BIM coordinators on the chat box? If you are, give us a shout out. Oh, yeah, we also don't know, like, what are you guys from the general contracting space, design space, um, engineering? Are you a subcontractor? Uh, we just kind of want to get a feel of, like, our audience right now. Yeah. Yeah, so hit us up on that chat box. See what you guys are up to. So um, what, is, what does it consist on like the, because we have this chart right here, we have the building information and modeling. So let's talk about like trade coordination, like what does that entail? Trade coordination? Yeah. Um, so recently we were on a project um, that was a high school and trade coordination would be, to me, be mostly between the MEP trades, and then you have your fire protection or like maybe a building management system. And it's establishing, we call it a priority of systems here, but you're gonna say like your main duct runs are gonna stay pretty much where they were per the design unless there's a structural issue. Mm -hmm. And then from there kind of trickling down to figure out, well, maybe a big um, cast iron pipe or carbon steel pipe would go there. And then, you know, fire protection stems would be like a little lower an electrical conduit and then kind of just making sure all the trades are going to fit together out in the field that everything can be hung mm -hmm. that everything can be built that you're not going to trap any water and uh that's to me when i think of trade coordination what comes to mind okay yeah so it's like kind of, kind of like your uh, communication with all the trades and all that right? yeah yeah what what about the data coordination part of it how do you see that because we we get like a, a lot of data from the architect and the MEP engineers, but sometimes, you know, it's not well coordinated. Yeah, so we, um, there's a lot of power within a, like a Revit model, like a BIM model, mm -hmm. to uh, extract that data, to be able to do your takeoffs instantly, and um, kind of also, I mean, I, I want to get your take on what you would think of data coordination too, but like if we had to do a design change, it's really easy to, do basically an overlay with schedules or just like uh, in Navis works of saying, well, we added this many elbows or like we were mm -hmm. able to duck this many feet or, you know, so stuff like that. And being able to get that data like that and then use it. Yeah, it's kind of like tying all your, kind of like the 5D 
with like the whole construction phase phases yeah. and allowing it because with Navis works we're going to talk about Navis works later you can we can also tie in your time of construction along with your estimation data and all that so you know exactly if you're staying on budget and on track for your projects absolutely now the modeling coordination part of it too is very important when you're um, setting up that communication stream with all the different trades. So you have kind of like your work sharing within Revit, as well as like the content generation and management. So you have like your families that need to be at different level of detail if you're taking it all the way to fabrication and facility Absolutely. management. Absolutely, yeah. And it's it, just a side note, it's really helpful to understand your end goal of the BIM process. Uh, the BIM coordination process before you get started. Um, it's important to know, like, is this just purely for clash detection? You know, your mm -hmm. level of detail doesn't need to be that specific. If you just need to know, like, I need a 24 by 24 inch space for this to fit through. But if you're going to a prefabrication level, then you have to up your level of detail. If you're trying to do facility management, you're going to need a different level of detail. And it's really important to know at the front end, what you're trying to get out of this process before you start. And uh, so that way you don't have to pivot halfway through and maybe go back and redo your families or update your model, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we have Hunter Eddington. He says he uses assembly systems to do data coordination. Assemble. Yeah, assemble yeah. is great. Yeah. Um, I've used that before. Uh, it's a great way, like, one thing that from a BIM coordinator standpoint that I like about Assemble or even like the Autodesk viewer is that it's browser based. So you can give access to someone out in the field or someone that's not as familiar with the Revit or Navisworks and they can have access to your 3D model and it's not, you can save a lot of labor on the 2D documentation side and you can also just enhance that field experience by allowing anyone with Google Chrome mm -hmm. to be able to view your model. And Assemble lets you do that, and it does a great job of that. So Cool. That's awesome. All right. So uh, what, why do BIM coordination? So for me, um, BIM coordination just, it just makes sense. It's just, if you, I mean, typically um, we, we like to start and we'll take a look at the, the engineering model, and this isn't, a knock on any engineers because it's it's hard to coordinate this stuff ahead of time and a lot of it's uh, more conceptual even but yeah it's not like you're replacing the engineer yeah absolutely and I mean the amount of money you can just frankly save by re like routing your pipe around your duct or your structure ahead of time mm -hmm. is is insane and being, able, yeah. being able to actually visualize it in 3D yes a lot of people like moving from the old paradigm where you're designing in 2D and you're not really seeing what's going on in the, in the 3D world, it's kind of like hard to do that coordination. But now with this 3D modeling software, you're able to see pretty much everything yeah. and kind of like merge the digital and the physical together. Yeah. I just want to take a moment to appreciate how cool it is. I mean, there are people from all around the world watching this right people now. From Mo Mozambique. Mozambique, India, India. Sweden. It's wow. crazy. Thank you all just for joining us. I mean... It's really cool just being able to talk to the whole world like this on That's awesome. YouTube. But uh, anyways, back to why I do BIM coordination. I think also from an owner's standpoint, um, being able to get that 3D visualization as well, being able to see like how your ceiling heights are going to work out or like if you need to add a soffit, like to just say like, well, let's add a six inch soffit and we'll just run that pipe through there. Like you say that, but then like when you can see it in a 3D space and understand like how that'll be off the top of your door or whatnot, it just changes everything. And then if you take it from just pure clash detection and go into prefabrication, uh, it, it's, I mean, the amount of money and time that you're gonna save to be able to do that and do it correctly, if you get it right, I mean, I had, I, I don't know if this number is accurate. I had an old boss a long time ago that said if he, if we drew 60% of the prefabrication pipe correct in BIM coordination, just 60%, 40% of it could have been wrong, it was still making money. Like that's oh. how much of a profit like you can make in when you move to that prefabrication space. And then taking a step further and going to facility management. Mm -hmm. 
image. Yeah, we have a we have this image from Autodesk, and it's kind of showing how like the new technology with like AR and also with point clouds. So you want to talk about a little bit of what you're doing with point clouds? Yeah. And, so yeah. point clouds. Um, so my name is like I said, I'm Jake, and I do the BIM a lot of the BIM coordination of all that, but another. Huge um, part of my responsibilities are uh, 3D reality capture, like so basically creating point cloud files from, in this image we have the BLK360 and then we've used the Matterport, a GeoSlam, you know, drones or whatnot. But I had a really interesting project that I'm working on right now is that we went with the BLK360 and we scanned um, a mechanical room that was being renovated. Um, they were gonna leave a couple of like the pipe um, where the penetrations and the pads were going to stay the same and the ceiling joists where you do your hangers going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. But it really, to them, it wasn't really necessary for to remodel all of the pipe per se. So what they did is they hired us to create a point cloud file for them with the BLK360. And then I went in and in Revit, I created the floor, the pads, the walls, the doors, and then the ceiling joist structure. And then we overlaid my model with the point cloud model in Navisworks. And now as they draw a new pipe, we're able to see the pipe that's gonna stay that's already existing, but it's just a point cloud file where it's gonna be and make sure there's no conflict with it. Oh, wow. And it's, uh, it's a really cool use case of just like an interesting take on like what is BIM coordination because it can be mm -hmm. so many things. Yeah. On the chat box, do you guys, have you guys used any point clouds for BIM coordination? Let's see, we have Dustin Smith. What sensors do you prefer? Um, in terms of scanning? Yeah. Uh, my, I mean, I just based on like the kind of projects we do, my bread and butter is mostly like the BLK360 with Recap Pro and then taking that into Revit and then now like Navisworks has been a thing. Which one is more user friendly to you? Is it like, Yes, um, the, the most user friendly thing is definitely the Matterport, Matterport, but it's also the most basic thing too. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the data. And then like, but doing something like in a BIM coordination sense, I would like to use the, uh, um, the BLK360 just because of the data we would get. Cool. All right. So let's move on to the BIM coordination process. Yes. So uh, let's talk about the uh, BIM the uh, BIM project executive plan. So, the ex yeah, the execution, execution plan. plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So currently, um, I'm almost done with this. We're doing a high rise um, in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and we have a BIM execution plan for this. And we kind of wanted to go through what does a BIM execution plan look like? What does it have in it? You know, what's important to have in there? Mm -hmm. So. Um, the first thing is just like your basic coordination requirements. I have my execution plan here as a cheat sheet because there's no way I was going to remember this entire document. Yeah. Um, so the coordination plan, the coordination requirements are basically saying you're going to model to this level of detail. If you're the electrician, you're going to do conduit that's greater than one inch. If you're the plumber, you're going to do pipe that's greater than one inch, you know, mm -hmm. ducts, you know, you're going to have your access points and you need to also, um, any clearances that you would need above anything. We just need a red transparent box above it that we can run clash detection through. So the first step is just the basic requirements for what needs to be modeled. And that's always project specific. Um, and then from there, sorry, checking my notes, we're going to go into the strategy of like the, the coordination strategy. And basically, this is where we would break the model up, per se, mm -hmm. or the building up into digestible weekly meetings. Mm -hmm. So for instance, for the high rise, we separated it by floor. Okay. So it was 15 floors and we would do like the basement and then we would move on to basement two. And then if basement two needed another week, we would do that. And then we would move up vertically through the building. But in another context, in a school that was one story, but very spread out, we would separate the building into what we call like areas. So we'd have like area A, Area B, which is just like a wing of the classroom. C is like a gym, you know. D could be the auditorium. 
and we would break out our coordination process by these areas and then create a schedule around how we chose to break out the model. Um, so what are what are the uh, best options, kind of like your lessons learned to like better communication with the team? Do you find it more of like having the nav like the Navis work as a viewer on online for like subcontractors to check out in the field? Or like? Yeah, so I've seen it. It's interesting because there are different ways to do BIM coordination. Um, excuse me. Currently, I'm on two polar extremes of it. So one of them was where you would have Typically, a general contractor would be in charge of the coordination process, and then all the subcontractors would provide models of what they were going to install. And then as a team, we'd all work together and coordinate the building. Mm -hmm. However, there's another end of the spectrum, which Daniel worked on with me, is where we were hired um, to do everything in-house. So we did all the MEP coordination between the two of us, and had to sort it out that way. So I think it kind of depends mm -hmm. on if it's external or internal. Um, internal, um, we just broke it out into areas and divided and conquered. But I think the one where you have all the companies coming together is when you need to say, like, based on, like, your modeling skills, how many modelers you can put on this, like, what is a reasonable weekly expectation that mm -hmm. you can turn over? You can draw a new area, and then you can go back and make the slight changes to what you had done and then determining how big an area can be or if you need to do half a level at a time, that kind of stuff. Okay, awesome. So then, um, and I'm just doing a, like a, a pretty broad flyover of this. You have, so we've done just the basic coordination requirements of like what needs to be modeled and then we did the coordination strategy, breaking it out into digestible areas and schedule and now you need to talk about your model structure, your structure of, I mean, things like naming conventions. Anyone that's had extensive experience with Navisworks, you need to um, re, you need to always have your file names be identical mm -hmm. when going into Navisworks because if you don't, they'll come in as a separate file. And that when you but when you do the overwrite you will always have your class report up to date. You just hit refresh. Right. So specifying little things like that. Um, also, like a big thing, and you can see on the screen here, and I don't know what I'm pointing at. It's above me. Um, <laughs> so we have like our color scheme, and this is actually like really critical. Um, yeah, right there, right, that right. guy. <laughs> um, it's really critical like when you're inside of a coordination model because if everything is just like generic gray, that gets spit out of Revit like it's going to be a mess and you're not going to know what you're looking at so mm -hmm. um like you can see I'm kind of colorblind but so duct is yellow and then fire protection is blue and then storm is that orange color and making sure that this is like a set the steel is a red and then we also have colors for like walls in the building are white you know just like basically and kind of transparency so and transparency so the ceilings will have a little bit of transparency to them and just tweaking your coordination model to where anyone can look at it and even if they're just saying like hey what's that blue pipe over there like us as the coordinators know that's fire protection like like that blue pipe can't go there it's um, going over a king stud mm -hmm. you know over the door or it's touching the, the steel you know so yeah. that um that is really important and like setting up that structure ahead of time to where your subcontractors know like when I upload my storm pipe it needs to be orange like every time so that way we don't have any confusion and then as the BIM coordinator you know how to set up your architectural background to be super digestible um, okay, so we have some questions we have Revit architectural model we need to make it ready for energy model setup do you know about it? <laughs> um, I think, sorry if I, Rishi, um, the BIM coordination process can be done by contractors or consultant teams. I think we've done just about every kind now to where we've been, I mean, Aval Lab is essentially like a BIM consultant or we'll, mm -hmm. we, you can hire us to do this process for you. But as someone who's worked at Evolve Lab, I've been hired by the general contractor to be the general contractor in the project and just gather the models. We've been hired to do the whole thing, like we were saying. I've also been hired 
by a subcontractor to just be their voice in the coordination process to where I'll do their modeling and I'll attend the meetings as their representative and advocate for them within the coordination process. Yeah. And the earlier they get us into the project, the easier. Always better. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, Johanna's Riz is asking, is there a color standard for each project? Um, I'm sure you could go on some forums and find one. Uh, we have one in our execution plan that's laid out here, and it's represented in the image above. Uh, that's pretty standard. That's pretty though. standard. Yeah, it's yeah. close. I mean, you might, from time to time, you might see fire protection come up as red, but we feel really good about this standard that we have, and it's worked really well on all of our jobs so far. Yeah. Sweet. And then the final thing, um, which I've already kind of touched on, so I'll just go back over it briefly, but is as a team agreeing on a priority of systems. And this is critical because I had a funny, I was on the coordination call yesterday um, and I said, hey, like so-and-so, your duct is in this pipe. And then the person goes, no, 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 his pipe is in my duct. <laughs> like, and I was like, I'm sorry, like I did that, I, I, I misspoke. But it's true, like if you don't have like a very set agreed upon priority of systems saying like the duct may like the steel isn't going anywhere. Like you have to figure it out unless you submit an RFI mm -hmm. and get a penetration approved. So like that is always like on the top mm -hmm. or like, um, you know, doors or windows like that's not going anywhere. So those aren't moving lights. Same thing. Right. But as you get down to like um, sprinkler stems or like one inch electrical conduit, they typically get moved down the list because it's just easier, frankly, when installing that stuff to move it around and mm -hmm. to snake it around. It's cheaper. Um, same with like flex duct can be moved a lot. And, and electrical. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but having everyone agree upon it, I mean, you can see like in my notes here, like we have them all crossed out because as the meeting's going on, like, people are arguing and advocating like, no, like mine needs to be higher than this. And like, so-and-so needs to be, um, whatnot, you know? So that is a really important thing, like to, to make sure before anything begins, like you agree on your priority of systems because it, it, no one's, no one wants to move. Like, I don't want to move. Like it's a lot of work, you know, removing, you spend all this time putting somewhere there. So making sure that everyone knows, like, and even as they go through the Navisworks model, they know, like, well, I have to move for duct, like I yeah. just do. So. Uh, Brandon wants to know if you can share the template of a BIM execution plan. You yeah, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of templates out there if you Google them, but yeah, we're, we'll be happy. Yeah, to we can, share we them. can blank some stuff out in this one and share it. Yeah, it's no sure. problem. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Dalton, is the coordination process different when working with design teams compared to a GC? You have more experience in the design world than I do. Yeah, when you're working in the design world, it's much easier because you have more control of your design. And you're, especially if you're working in, in Revit and, and not AutoCAD, you have you know, more flexibility to move your design around and all that. Where compared with the GC, they're kind of like competing against each other. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's more friction. Yeah, there. and it depends on your contract too, right? Yeah. So as a GC, if you just have a fixed fee, like you just, I bid the job and I said I would do it at this, like every elbow adds up, every penetration adds up. But if it's a design build thing where the design team's coming alongside you throughout mm -hmm. the coordination process, it gets a little easier. Um, to do that. Yeah, especially if there's like a lot of like addendums and mm -hmm. yeah. RFIs and exactly. stuff like that. There's a lot of more friction. A lot of things can change. Um, I saw Rishi too. So a BIM coordination team is actually a consultant that can be contracted by either contractors, consultants, or even the project owner. Um, that's how we um, operate as Evolve Lab. Um, I worked at several GCs that they have their own um, VDC, Virtual Design and Construction Department, in-house. Um, mm -hmm. What we do at Evolve Lab is we enable someone who is an expert in the field. Like, they're as good as it gets in the field, but they don't necessarily have the money or the resources or, or whatever happens to hire an in-house BIM person. Maybe it's just a one-off project that requires it, you know, mm -hmm. like, and they want to start bidding on work that is required to have a BIM guy, basically. Um, that's where we come in and we come alongside you and allow you to do that.
but a lot of places just have their own in-house. I worked at an MEP firm that had 60 drafters full-time that they did the coordination and then produced the fabrication drawing. So it's, it's, it's a case-by-case -case, um, mm -hmm. thing. Cool. Um, All right. So let's move on to... I think this is going well. Yeah. I think this is going good. <laughs> All right, so let, um, let's talk about setup, setting up your coordination Revit model. So this is more when you're getting um, your uh, all your trades set up in um, Revit. So you first want to get your MEP with your architectural and structural models all linked up. And what you want to do is start creating those 3D um, Navis export views where you're filtering it out a lot of those systems. That way you can bring them nicely into Navisworks. Yeah. Yeah. So that way you can easily just start automating that process when you're exporting your views into uh, Navis. Yeah. And I think Daniel, um, this one here, this uh, the installation drawings, this Daniel did a beautiful job creating those. And it's really yeah. easy to like, even in a 2D world, if you get these color systems right, um, and now in the age of Bluebeam, not as many people are printing things out. I think those are just beautiful and really helpful. Yeah, it definitely helps the subs to just like being able to just quickly see what's going on on the plans instead of seeing just like a bunch of lines and dimensions. Mm -hmm. So it's better to create those filters and and start automating a lot a lot of that. We also like uh, been working on with like Dynamo to start automating some of that stuff, just bringing like like your templates and also dimensioning and tagging. exporting the Navis exporting. views in Revit. You want to talk a little bit about setting up those 3d views for export? Yeah. So in three and in, in uh, Revit, once you have all your family set up with all your share parameters and all that, you can start to really control the visibility of all your components, your systems and all that. And then you can bring in all the, uh, your filters and start to come out kind of like giving colors, like in Navis works. So you kind of be you can be consistent throughout the process. Absolutely. Yeah. What's okay. Regarding your question. Um, links to ceiling grids, sockets, any of that stuff. Yeah. So you want to make sure that it's important that you're working with the most current Revit model, and when you're bringing it in, make sure you're working with a model that it has. The, the, uh, all the updates for your addendums and all your RFIs, and also making sure that you have all your clearances um, visible. And once you have all your dimensions and stuff in there, then you can start making changes and everything will automatically update as you move stuff around. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. any Let's... questions on uh, Revit model? All right, no questions. Demo time. This is the best time. All right. Let's keep this is my. We have to do a little bit of shuffling. Sorry, guys. See how many things I knock off the table. Okay. All right. So, what is your current standard or order of importance? From Brian, I can read you what this this project was. Like I said. Um, it changes from project to project. Yeah. Depends on what you agree upon in your meeting. So we had number one was structure and equipment supports. Mm -hmm. Number two was king studs, top tracks, and corner studs. Number three was light fixtures and distributions. Um, number four was the HVAC system. Mm -hmm. And number five was the gravity system, aka sanitary, anything that needed to have a slope to it, basically. Okay, and Derek is also asking, do you emphasize modeling insulation? Yes, we do. Back? <laughs> you, yes. Yes, yeah, very important. We've gotten burned for it. Yeah, you can get burned not doing it. Yeah. Um, quick side story, and then I'll finish my list. I was on a project. Um, it's way more than just like pipe insulation. Um, we had, it was the lobby of like an office building, and there's, uh, I'll just say one foot ceiling. You know, it's pretty tight. And uh, the BIM, one of the BIM modelers for the structure forgot to add four inches of fire spray to the steel. So you take your one foot ceiling and make it a, whatever the math is on that, an eight inch ceiling, you know, yeah. that's huge. Like that is, 
I mean, you redo your coordination process at that point. Hangers are also like a contentious thing. Do I do it? Do I just make sure that I'm not underneath like a duct run? That's also something you decide at the beginning of the project if you're going to go ahead and take the step to do hangers. If you're doing field layout, you have a Hilti tool or something that you're going to go out there and pre-place the hangers before the concrete's poured, then yeah, it's probably worth your time to do it. So anyway, sorry. So number five was gravity. Number six is the pipe rack. Number seven is the cable tray. Number eight is the electrical system. Number nine is process pipe, um, med gas, natural gas, fuel lines. We didn't have a lot of that in this building. Um, 10 is domestic water. Mm -hmm. it's just, and then 11 was the fire protection system. Got bumped to the bottom. <laughs> I felt bad for that guy. Yeah. I mean, they can run it anyway. Well, what he did is, um, if the person on the bottom of the list, he would actually just wait a week. Um, he would let the dust settle. Uh, like, let us coordinate, let the dust settle, and then come back um, and do it the week later, the next week, and just fit where he could. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Hunter, that's a great point. If you don't have um, fire spray modeled or pipe insulation modeled in Navisworks, you can set a tolerance and just say, like, anything that's within two inches of this pipe, like, let me know. Like, make it come up in the class report. So that's another um, great way to do it. Cool. So without further ado, so this is... Um, this is one of my beloved Navisworks models. Um, so I wanted to go, well, I guess we'll just start about like, so this is Navisworks. Um, uh, everyone, so, hey, sorry. Uh, what are we looking at here? File naming conventions, very important. So I'm gonna go into my selection tree. And then when I open this up, you can see on the left here, this is the name of all the files. Um, you can see that there are too many files in this model, but every time, like let's say like level eight sleeves changes, mm -hmm. they're gonna, when they re-upload, they're gonna put that exact same name. And then all I have to do is hit this refresh button and it will load the new model. And then it will also update my class report. And just, I can easily see quickly, like I don't have to go through every week and add these 50, 60 files to the project. Um, so that is super helpful. Um, alignment of models. So tip, So the best way to do it is to get your alignment straight in Revit, share the coordinates with everyone, mm -hmm. no problem. But sometimes you have um, an issue where they're using, oh God, sorry, my little, they're using maybe a different software that's not gonna talk to it. And you can actually take, so I have the steel selector right now. I could actually move it 10 feet and you can see that it's shifted. Um, we obviously don't want to leave it there, but if something does come in out of mm -hmm. alignment and you have an insertion point or like grid lines that you can work off of, um, it's just a nifty tool. Where did it go? Why does it keep going over there, Daniel? It doesn't like oh. us. Zero. Okay. So what are the different uh, file, uh, file types that you can load in from programs? Well, a lot. Um, I don't have the official list in front of me, but I can tell you a really good... So this project has a Revit background, and then DWG is mostly everything else. But if I go to my views here, um, I'm going to go into basement one. So this is a parking garage that has car elevators, mm -hmm. which is cool. I mean, I'm from Texas, so I don't see that a lot of that. <laughs> and so the cars come down these elevators and then they come in and you can see here, let me block out that red stuff quickly, um, that there are parking stackers. And these parking stackers basically um, they'll lower down, car will drive onto it, and then they'll be lifted up. So the problem was is that they, the, t the company doing this drew these models in SolidWorks. Okay. So, but Navisworks is like the great equalizer of the BIM world, if you will. Mm -hmm. Navisworks actually supported the 
SolidWorks model. And however, you and can also support IFC, IFC, Revit, um, CAD, several things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a list. If you just look up AutoCAD or Navisworks file types yeah. that are acceptable, you can find it. But so we got this SolidWorks model and then manually aligned it like I showed. And I mean, it was crazy, like being able to take that. And then also just a cool little, this is more like a case study. So what I had, these red blocks we created in Revit. So these are Revit families. And you can see that um, these are the voids, basically, that, so this is what space the car could potentially take up. Now this little like horn in the front could and be like steel. Clearance. It's yeah. a clearance zone. Yeah, clearance and zone. being able to model a family, it took us 15, 30 minutes, and then you just drop them in there based off of um, where they go. We were, a we were able then to provide this model to the construction team, and they were able to route around all of this clearance and fit down these tight um, places. I mean, so, you know, certain things, like this one, for example, like uh -huh. that's a 12 inch storm line, like that's the drainage line that's not gonna move. And like, we're, we're also able to take that information um, and give that to the design team and just say, hey, here's a heads up, like we need some help here because that's not gonna move, like we can't move that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, um, that's really cool. We'll see, what else? So the big, like when, when most people think of Navisworks, they think of clash detection. Mm -hmm. um, have you worked with uh, Glue? Yes. Wait, on the cloud? Oh, sorry. Have you guys, uh, one question for uh, on the chat box. Have you guys, do you guys use uh, the cloud much or more, more offline? What is that experience for you guys? Yeah, BIM, yeah. BIM 360 versus just like an internal server because yeah. we've used both. Um, they both have their pros and cons. Mm -hmm. uh, BIM 360 design I actually quite like. Mm -hmm which is great, you know, that helps. Um, BIM 360 glue uh, is nice because you can actually use it as like, excuse me, inside of Navisworks Manage, there's a BIM 360 version of it. Yeah. So as those funnel in, keep an eye on the BIM 360 versus, but I wanna get into Clash Reports quick, because okay. when most people think of Navisworks, they think of uh, a Clash Report. Um, so under Home, so I'm on level two, so I have these viewpoints set up that let me hop around the building. So level two, level two is just messy in this project. And uh, I wanna talk about like another unique case study. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get rid of my selection tree, home, clash detective, came in way over there. There it is, come here, <laughs> get rid of that. Okay, so I, for the purpose of this project, I like to keep it like super simple mm -hmm. and you can do your clash report like so many different ways. And I'm not saying that this is the right way because it's a very minimal way to approach it, but it helps me just say like, these are all the duct issues on level two, like all at once. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see here under selection. So, and so you have sex selection A and selection B. So on the left, I have all of the duct models selected. And then on the right, based on that priority of systems that we talked about, I went through and selected all the lighting models, all the structural components that the duct can't be in conflict with. Mm -hmm. And then I ran my report. And then after I ran my report, I am the, I didn't, someone taught me this at my old job, Anthony, Leo, if he's watching this, he figured this Shout out. out. <laughs> Shout out um, at Dynamic Systems. He figured this out, not me, but, um, I like to break it up by levels. So basically what you do is you take all these or all the clashes here that are on level two and you can shift. And then we actually made a way faster Wednesday on this Yeah, yeah. plug there. Um, if you're not following us on LinkedIn, <laughs> but you can right click and group them and you select group and then you can name that group. And then, so I sorted by level and then grouped all of level two together. So now what happened here was, so I'm going to hit hide other. So we have dim other, which gives you this kind of like skeleton of the building. You can turn off transparent building, transparent dimming, 
which gives you like this Darth Vadery looking <laughs> clash report. And then you can also do hide other, which is not going to give you any context on where it is within the building, but it does really break out the clashes for you. I really like to if you import like a like a 2D background. Oh yes, a CAD background. CAD background. Mm -hmm. That kind of helps too with, with yeah. this kind of view. So if your floor plan, or you can even export them, but what you can do is you can either use your provided DWGs or export a DWG and have that in mm -hmm. your Navisworks model so you can see the floor plan, which is also yeah. awesome. So what happened here was uh, the duct and everything was clear uh, when we did this a few months ago. And then I ran my clash report about two weeks ago, and all of a sudden, level two lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> and I'm like, what happened? Like, we, we already did that. And what I found out was, and when I hide it, you can see that the structural model had changed, but it's because they added the steel for, this is a ballroom. Mm -hmm. So they added the steel to hang projectors, to hang mm, curtain lighting. wall, divide, lighting, chandeliers, little like divider walls. And as we like looked into this more, what we realized um, was that a lot of this angle iron, it's not a prefabricated thing. So you're gonna go out, a guy's gonna go out there and with a saw and a torch and a welder, he's gonna install this based on some drawings. And what we figured out is that in this specific situation, we're going to leave the duct where it is because it's not hitting any prefabricated steel that's just going to be there waiting for them. Mm -hmm. And that we're going to provide this duct layout to the team that will be in the field adding all the angle iron. And uh, then they're going to work around this duct. You know, they're going to plan around it because we've, we've coordinated it. And that's like the beauty of this process is that you can look at this and you can even say, well, this isn't prefabricated angle iron, and this duct is prefabricated, and it's already going there, and like can't move it, mm -hmm. and it's great. Um, I just saw from Ilya, uh, how do you guys actually report the clashes to the design teams? Daniel, I feel like you have some good experience with clash report exporting. Um, I feel like when you create the, the um, I like to create like HTML reports mm -hmm. that includes like the clashes and also it has like an image of the snapshot of the actual clash. So when we write the report here. Yeah, when you write a report, HTML. Tabular, right? Is what mm -hmm. you want to go for? Yeah, and then it creates a, you know, your report that you can send out to the subs and they can see it on the iPad or so whatever. Put this on your desktop. So yeah, so. All right. And then another cool thing about it was um, the viewer. Would you? Yes. So when you're exporting, so they can see, they don't necessarily need to have. So this and, so like I said, I had this based on levels. Mm -hmm. So what you notice is that level three through roof are blacked out. It's not because the report didn't run, it's because I had that section cut below to two, so it's not gonna pull up anything. But you can see in level two, because of the way I had it grouped, it's just gonna give you an image of everything. Yeah. But if you were to have them broken out by individual clashes, it would give you that whole list. Yeah, exactly. So that's how we do reporting. Um, also, we like to, I mean, the design team, um, I always love it when the design team participates in the coordination process mm -hmm. when they're on the phone you know they have a good eye they know this building well they designed it mm -hmm. we're just trying to make it work and they can they can say like well hey just like let's just go around um mm -hmm. the staircase here and just move that down like or we don't really need that like or you know what i'll give you guys a half inch on the ceiling there you know that it's really great when i love it when the design team is active and participating. And even when like with uh, with the subs, like some subs don't have like Navis works or Revit or anything like that. Yeah. And sometimes it's like it's good to use like the the free online viewers. Yeah, the A360 viewer. A360 viewers. It's great. Yeah, check that out. That's free and you can just upload your model and then you can see all your layers. And yeah. Turn things on and off. Okay, so do you have one model for each floor? Yes. Why not a single model for the whole construction? That is because we we have one for every floor or by area. 
because we want to know, we want to be able to break out the coordination process into digestible pieces. If we were to just have one model, it would depend on how you structured it. When you break these out, and when you're selecting on your, yeah, on your selection, tool. I can say level eight. And then I can run that with only things that are on level eight as well. Uh, it's just a real, it's a, it's a better way to be able to break out your coordination process and not say like, you can keep people accountable. You can say your level eight duct is due today, you know, and just give me your model for your level eight duct instead of they just upload a whole building model. And then you have to take the time to go through and overlay them and see what changed. It's, I just prefer it to be broken out that way. Another question, uh, can Navis use the Revit Eliminates? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, so when you're... I, my Arch is a Revit file. Yeah, so when you when you go to view... Well, that's CAD. Uh, yeah, but you have your properties. Okay, there. grapple wall or something. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you have all your prop. You wanna make sure that you have your properties on? Yeah. And that's gonna give you... All the information. Your Eliminates and then all your Revit like information. information. Mm -hmm. so yeah check that out really helpful so that's like an advantage um in terms of just like pure clash detection i don't see a huge difference between a cad file a dwg and a revit file but the information you get out of a revit model is so much more that it assists in greater ways you know yeah, all the data that you have all the so data that's there is so rich yeah, yeah exactly all right, so we have about a couple more minutes. Let's move on to the next demo of the point clouds. You wanna show that? Yes, I do. I feel loud. Bear with me here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So pending, um, I dropped it in. You can try it. And then I want the RCP file. All right. Please open. Okay, it's not gonna work, Daniel. It's not gonna work. Sorry, guys. Um, but anyways, this is pretty cool just to show you what we did. Um, so this is an actual model that you yeah. So I made this model from a point cloud. Yeah, and I'm sorry that the point cloud's not working right now. We had to switch computers. You need the support files for the point cloud. Um, review, review point. So we're gonna enable sectioning. Fit the section. So we can come in here and you can see like from the point cloud data, this is that mechanical room. So you can see the joists, the pads, and actually I just cut this pipe, but these are the two inlets, uh, really simple stuff. But then when you overlay that point cloud file over it, mm -hmm. you can see everything on top of each other. So it's just another really good use. And then you just append all your new uh, pipe models or equipment models, pumps, whatever, and be able to view it mm -hmm. pretty easily. So. Is it pretty easy to uh, import like from the Revit to... Yeah, so uh, I just had to go through this whole exercise. Um, you need to assign an origin point and recap, and then you need to go back into Revit and assign in your 3D model that same origin point. So like for this project, my origin point is right at the corner of this door. It's right there. That's where I set the origin point. So I need to make sure that the origin point was there in the point cloud and then the origin point was there in the Revit model. And then when you bring them in now, it works. They play nice together. Cool. Awesome. All right, so let's go back to our presentation slide. All right, so let's talk about the benefits of beam coordination to finish off. Um, so as you guys saw, the benefits, you can quickly create those clash reports and run it through the design team and create that line of communication. But another cool thing about it is um, kind of like merging that digital and physical world together. And um, I saw something really cool uh, recently with from Enscape. If you guys are familiar with Enscape, you can create realistic renderings right away like live renderings while you're modeling so they they have this blog by then sign that you guys should check out where you combine the mechanical electrical and plumbing all together and you can actually put yourself inside of the model yeah and i like that's walk through yeah that's 3d like 
whatever that is. Like, yeah. that's, that's a rendering. Yeah, so that kind of gives you the idea of like, you can do it in VR or actually in an AR where you're mm -hmm. walking into the space and seeing exactly what's going on. All right. Um, Brian, not, they all come in at zero, zero, zero. It's the origin point of the original file that it comes in at, but Navis is just going to read it at zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Can you go back to that first one? You mind? Which one? The, the original slide, just with our names and stuff on it. Yeah. I'm going to play the video. But yeah, so that's the really tricky part, getting uh, getting that origin set correctly and making sure that everyone has that information. Um, you just got to do the legwork at the beginning mm -hmm. to do that. Do we want to, uh, which LOD do we need for clash detection? You think you could probably get by at about 200 just for general. Well, for construction, for construction documentation, you want LOD 350. 350? Yeah, and then yeah. if you're taking it to facility management, then you want to go up to like 500. You have any experience with VR, Daniel? Um, yeah, I have experience like uh, what I was talking about earlier with Enscape. You can actually go in and create your views and set all your materials for MEP because usually with MEP systems, you don't really assign materials. But with Enscape, it makes it easier for you to run that exercise and uh, create those like VR environments. Mm -hmm. And then with, there's a couple of um, apps on the Autodesk uh, store that you can use to export to AR. So yeah. You can actually with like when you're in uh, yeah. port as well, if you have those like fancy AR headsets. Yeah. You can also use iPads too that have basically a gimbal type thing where you move the iPad around and you can see the model as you like move the iPad around in like more of an augmented reality type yeah. situation. VR always, it kind of makes me sick. Uh, <laughs> I saw a question like the difference between a BIM manager and a BIM coordinator. And I really think it depends on where you're working. Like a, like a, an architecture firm would have a BIM manager and they would make sure that your standards are up to date, your exports are up yeah, to date, right? Work, your families. We're hand in hand with the design team. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. a BIM coordinator is more someone that would make sure that all the models are being brought together in the correct way and the clash reports are being run and the, the building team has what they need either in the field to know like you're going to have a tight area here or like as a subcontractor, like, hey, we need to reroute this. Um, mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. I'm sure it's, it depends firm to firm on what the job title means specifically. So yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, we also have our li on our LinkedIn um, page. We yeah. do uh, way faster Wednesdays to give you tips and tricks. Yeah. Also, we have a free membership that you can join. Yeah, on evolvebim.com. Right or add us on LinkedIn. We want to talk to you guys more about this. I love. We both love geeking out with people. So. Hit us up on LinkedIn and then go on the website, do all that fun stuff and look forward to keep talking to you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys.